you did not bring a Bible with you, we have brand new Bibles there in the back by the soundboard and nice table there, and they are a gift to you if you do not have a newer Bible that is uh, something that you could read. It's the English Standard Version back there, and we would love for you to have that Bible if you don't have one. So that would be our gift to you. Hebrews 10, 29 through 26 through 39. This week is a busy week for me. I have the privilege of leading Child Evangelism Fellowship for the state of California, and this week is our summer training for youth, young adults. We call it Christian Youth in Action, CYIA, and it is a blast to be a part of it. You got to understand that there's 63 uh, young adults, uh, high school young adult age. Uh, I think there's someone sitting in the front row that's done that a few years before with us, Sarah. And um, and it is it is an incredible experience. And oh, this year and last year we've had to modify it a little bit because of just the different things going on. But the beauty of it is, is you have these these high schoolers, these young adults that are giving up not just one week of their summer, but more than likely two to three weeks of their summer to go to neighborhoods, to apartment complexes, to all different types of places and set up unannounced essentially and set up out in the park and they go and they do these presentations of the gospel for five days. And it is a blast to see that. And this year, some of our groups have even uh, done reservations beforehand just to kind of do some things a little differently. And I know two of the groups that are in this area have 20, 25 kids already signed up. Uh, and they, they don't even know who and what they're going to yet, but they've signed up. And it is incredible. We see hundreds of kids come to know the Lord every summer in this program. And then after this week, which there's 15 of these clubs happening this week, which they're basically these, uh, these campers, we call them, are learning how to do it this week. The rest of the summer, there's these uh, five-day clubs all over Southern California. Literally thousands of children hear about Christ and accept Christ. And so I want you to pray about that, and we have the privilege of being a part of that because, well, I'm here. <laughs> so uh, we, we have that, but uh, I encourage you to pray about that, and it's a lot of fun. Christian Youth in Action, you can take a look online if you want about that. I'm going to ask a question that I know everyone in here is, is going to go, yes, Scott, we get it. So I'll actually, I'll take a step back. I'm not even going to ask it as a question. I'm just going to make a statement. We live in one of the most bizarre times in history. Now I'll ask a question. Anyone disagree? <laughs> uh, I got you on that one. Now, you know, I want you to think about this for just a moment. On one hand, it's, it's a time that is shot through with agony and catastrophe and tragedy and violence and, and suffering of every kind. We see it day in and day out. It's kind of like, okay, what's the running number in Chicago this weekend for how many people have been killed? You know, it's that type of awfulness, right? And we see it all the time in the news. And and those of us who actually step back and take a broader look at that know that we're just seeing the, the tip of the iceberg on the awful junk that's going on. We're only seeing the stuff that makes it into the news. Not all of the stuff that's boiling out there before that ever happens. The awfulness of abuse, the awfulness of children being ripped to shreds by, by families that, that don't care for them. It's terrible. It's terrible. And that's just our own country, and we haven't even stepped outside of the borders into the awfulness elsewhere. So we know it's just the tip of the iceberg of the brutality around the world. But on the other hand, this is what's so weird about us. On the other hand, we don't want to hear about it. 
On the other hand, we don't want to hear about it. We, we, we've grown into a society of soft people. The minute that there smells like there's conflict or having to deal with conflict, people run and hide in the mountains and run away. While most of the world watches death every day without morphine, without any medical help, without any opioids or anything like that, and deals with gashes and amputations and all of that with no antiseptics or stitches, we flip out when we see a poor dead dog on the side of the road. Or... It makes the news alongside of the awfulness of everything. It makes the news that we stopped traffic for a a goose to get across with its little geese thingies, goslins or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's like we're soft people. It's really weird. We get mad. At things that are just interesting. And what's, I guess, most appalling in all of it is that when it comes to God, we don't want to hear the truth about the whole totality of who God is. We've created a soft people that only want to hear one side of God. And the dangerous part of that is if we don't hear the whole part and the whole understanding, the totality of who God is, we are not teaching people the terror of judgment. And then there's 17 people that get up and leave. No. See, in our society now, the only type of motivation that many want to hear is about grace. Most people don't want to hear about judgment. Yeah, don't judge me. They wag their finger at you with a judging matter, you know. Don't judge me. And what happens is that the conviction of judgment in our lives disappears and we get an incomplete view of God an incomplete view of Christ. And the writer of the book of Hebrews, oddly enough, is dealing with that exact same issue all the way back then. He's all, hey everyone, I'm not going to be silent about the wrath of God. I am not going to be silent about that. This is, this is a book that's really interesting. If you've been with us through the journey of this book, you understand that the writer of this book is completely devoted to living by faith and future grace and the incredible knowledge of who Jesus is, and Jesus is greater. Will you say that with me? Jesus is greater. Amen? And that's incredible. It's the grace that's dripping out of this book. Chapter after chapter celebrates what Jesus has done and how he's greater than what was in the old covenant and how he, his, his one and final act of sacrifice has sealed the deal. Has freed us from sin. Has turned our future into a paradise of hope. And the book begins and ends with that in mind. But like no other book in the New Testament, this book is also relentless about warnings. It's relentless about warnings. It's relentless about the dangers of being careless in the Christian life. And the warnings are are not that you know, hey, be careful, you may be forfeiting your heavenly rewards. No, these warnings are even greater. Hey, be careful, you may be forfeiting your soul. But we don't want to talk about that. So here in this book stands a motivational aspect that is not 
just grace. It's also judgment. And in this, we have a solemn appeal that we see here in verse 26. It's the fourth of five exhortations in Hebrews. It's once again written to believers and followers. And in the sequence, if you, I'm just going to give you a little backstory once again, if you haven't been with us. In the sequence of what's gone on, the other exhortations have been the believer who begins to drift from the word in Hebrews 2. Soon as you drift, you will start to doubt the word in Hebrews 3. And soon you will become dull to the word in Hebrews 5 through 6. And you will become lazy in your spiritual life. And this will result in then despising the word. And that's the theme of today. Man, don't despise God's word. Got a phone call here at church, I don't know, maybe 10 days ago, a person that was complaining about something that didn't go to church here, so stop looking around. <laughs> oh, it's always dangerous, right? You know, who said that? You did. So this person who we don't know thought it would be nice to call us and tell us how evil we are. And that it's because of people like us who he's not met that he doesn't go to church anymore. I'm like, awesome. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Apparently, we will not be seeing you anytime soon. I'm like, what, what, what's the purpose? And this is obviously a person that's ended up where? He's despising God's word and you go no 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 he just doesn't like church Er. who is the head of the church jesus is last time i checked if you are against god's church you are against jesus jesus is the only one that gets us back to god so you have now decided to despise god and his plan that's how dangerous this plays out And so we have this appeal that our writer gives us. Dive in with me in verse 26. Because he he really starts to dive in just immediately after saying, Hey guys, don't forsake the meeting with each other as saints, as some are encouraging you to do, but encourage one another in a different way, and that's to be together and to live life together as the saints, as the body of Christ, all the more as you see the day drawing near. And as we said last week, do you see the day drawing near where Christ is returning? I do. It's inching closer every single second. And so he goes on to say in verse 26, for if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, then no longer, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. So the writer is making a plea by, let's be completely out open with this here, graphically outline terrors of a word that we don't use much in our society today. I put abandonment in there because I think people understand that word a little bit better. You, you know, you feel abandoned by someone, someone leaves you, someone goes a different direction. The biblical understanding or the biblical word for that is apostasy. And that's what our writer is dealing with here. It's a person that is refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize Christ as Lord and Savior. And this opening terror is that it prevents Christ's atoning sacrifice for us from working. I mean, look at that. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. This should be a terror for us. The preacher is not saying, let me get you 
through this. So you got to thread a needle on this one. So pay attention, everyone. Pay attention. The preacher is not saying that if believers persist in sinning deliberately, there's going to be a point where the effect of Christ's sacrifice runs out. He's not saying, okay, I paid for your sins up to this point. You have now gone over. I gave a dollar's worth of sin coverage and you took a dollar five. So that's not what's being said here. The writer is actually describing a corrupt state characterized by two things in a person's life. One you see willfully, another term for that would be deliberate. The Greek would say deliberate, willfully, intentionally. You've intentionally are sinning and it is continual. It's willful and it's continual. It's deliberate and it goes on and on and on. It persists. A person that persists in open rebellion against God and his word. The individual then in this understanding, this person has heard God's word, has received his word. Now, I'd be, notice I didn't say believe. He's received God's word. He understands it. There's plenty of people that understand God's word and say fooey to it. This person, though, takes that and intentionally, knowingly rejects it. Calvin, John Calvin, explained it like this. The writer describes as sinners, not those who fall in any kind of sin, but those who forsake the church and separate themselves from Christ. There is a great difference between individual lapses and a universal desertion of that kind, which makes for a total falling away from the grace of God. So interestingly enough, what our writer is writing about here today are people that have been in church. Notice I haven't said they're believers. It's people who have been in church, have heard the gospel, have received the gospel, and then go the other way. And our writer saying, that is terrifying. That is terrifying. Because he joins that with a second great terror. Because there's no sacrifice, then judgment follows, right? There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of fire which will consume the adversaries. And this is an echo of Isaiah 26 that says, Let the fire reserved for your enemies consume them. It's a form, it's a gripping form, it's a very colorful, full-blown picture of what judgment looks like. And the point here is that those who reject Christ inherit a fearful expectation of judgment, whether they're aware of it or not. Let's go back in time a little bit. Let's go back in time, late 1700s, early 1800s in the United States. There was a writer of a book that was very much against Christianity. The book was called Age of Reason, Thomas Paine. He had incredible influence, and his influence was against belief in God. He had a big influence that way. And he came to his last days in 1809 and he was completely disillusioned and he was unhappy. He was not a person that you wanted to be around. Well, during his final moments of life, they actually had someone there transcribing what he was saying, which actually was something that happened quite a bit in that day. That's why we have so many of these statements from that time frame. 
I want you to listen with the heart of how is this guy doing with the Lord? Okay? In light of rejecting something that he knew about, rejecting something that he understood, this is what he said. I would give worlds if I had them that age of reason had not been published. O oh Lord, help me. Christ, help me. O oh God, what have I done to suffer so much? But there is no God. But if there should be, what will become of me hereafter? Stay with me for God's sake. Send even a child to stay with me, for it is hell to be alone. If ever the devil had an agent, I have been that one. Those were his last words. I would say he was living in terror of the next moment. Wouldn't you? No sacrifice for sin. an impending doom that's coming forward. You know what I have to say about that? Never sign me up for that. Never sign me up for this understanding that Jesus' sacrifice for sin is not sufficient for me. That's a terror. If you really understand sin, zip all the way back to the beginning of this message. If you really understand the evil in this world, I want no part of it if there is no sacrifice for sin that works. Because all of us would be in the same boat. And the reader or the writer goes on to explain the logic behind this terror. And this is a typical argument that happens in Scripture. It's a lesser, greater type of argument. And I'll explain that as we go. The preacher lays out this logic behind the terrors in verse 28. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has Trample, well, let me go back. I'm sorry, I skipped verse 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's the lesser. That's number one. The greater, how much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? The lesser is directly out of Deuteronomy 17. And essentially it stipulates this in the Old Covenant. On the testimony of two or three witnesses, a man could be put to death. Now no one could be put to death on the testimony of only one witness, but on the testimony of two or three, the hands of the witnesses had to be the first one to put him to death and the hand, then the hands of the people but the idea was the purging the evil among you. So if this person had said fooey to following God was apostate, if they disregarded the law of Moses, set it aside, they could execute him. And then, so there's no doubt, there's two or three witnesses no mercy, done deal. And then you see verse 29, how much severe, the greater. So there's a metaphor that happens in here. Did you catch it in verse 29? Did you catch what the metaphor is? It's taking the Son of God and the whole book of Hebrews to this point is saying what about Jesus? Jesus. Jesus is greater. Jesus is perfect. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus is the one that saves. It's taking that Jesus and grinding him into the dirt. That's what it says there. I'm not making that up. 
who have trampled underfoot the Son of God. And turning away from Christ. That is what this person has done. And so this is an attack on the person of Jesus. It's an attack on the person of Jesus. And then second, as you see there, it's an attack on Christ's work. Has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. This sort of person here, you got to understand this. Once again, this is a person who has professed faith in Christ, probably at some point, has listened to the word preached, has celebrated, and has partaken in the Lord's Supper that we're going to take here in a little while. But his faith, and I put that in quotes, his faith was not genuine. He rejects Jesus' blood. He says it's, essentially, you know what he's saying? It's common. It's just common blood. It's common blood. And then the last part of it there, insulted the spirit of grace. Attack on the person of Christ, attack on the Christ's work, and then rejects the person, and the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of grace. It's the only place in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit is called this specific wording. The Spirit of grace. Now we see it in Zechariah 12.10, but it is a beautiful title, actually. And it's meant to be a beautiful title. You take the beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. Now, those of us who are believers, we know, or hopefully you should know, what the Holy Spirit does and who He is. He enlightens us. He seals our hearts in the adoption that we have had with Christ. He, he regenerates us with spiritual life. He grafts us into the body of Christ, all of it from the effects of grace. And we need to take note of the spirit of grace and the attributes of the Holy Spirit and devotionally give thanks for who the Spirit is in us and the work of the Spirit in us. He gives, you know what the Holy Spirit does? He gives and he gives and he gives and he gives. Isn't that awesome? And this person has said, phooey. I'm going to insult Christ. I'm going to insult his blood. I'm going to insult the spirit of grace. And you know what this all deals with? It's a big old word called pride. The original sin. I can be like God. And what happens is that the Holy Spirit had come to this person, had witnessed to him about spiritual reality, had courted this person, and the person rejected the Spirit's witness with this pride. I don't need you to reject the gracious work of the Spirit renders one completely lost. In understanding this, the question in verse 29 needs to explode in our minds. Did you catch the question? How much severe punishment do you think he will deserve who was, has trampled under the foot the Son of God, which has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? A mercy gone. I mean, just go down the list. Mercy gone. But this isn't just about physical death. This is then about a spiritual death. 
Now, like I said earlier, a lot of people will reject this today. I will tell you right now that if you go and you look on our website later this week, this will not be the most popular sermon ever done at West Hills Church. Probably isn't going to get a lot of airplay. I may actually get people that say it's too judgmental, right? Maybe visiting today and going, Woo, boy, I picked a fun one. But here's the point with this. There's a, a group out there today that reject the judgment side of Christ. And they want to picture Jesus as uh, just the lamb, a nice buddy lamb dude. And want to picture Jesus as like, hey, if you give me your teddy bear, I'm going to give you a bigger teddy bear. Kind of, that's, that's, that's the extent of their picture of Jesus. But they forget that the Lamb of God comes with what? In Revelation 6, 16. Wrath. Judgment. Matter of fact, it's a big one in Child Evangelism Fellowship that a lot of us sit there and we ponder the, um, you know, a lot of us are involved in CEF because we understand the importance of reaching children. And Jesus made it perfectly clear, you don't mess with kids. They get a, they get a special judgment, those that mess with kids, right? Better for them to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around their neck I want you to listen to Jesus' words for a moment because we're really good. I mean, you can go, like I said, you can go anywhere online today and listen to a bunch of how awesome Jesus is in his grace and his mercy. And we need to preach on that a lot, right? But we also need to preach on the fact that Jesus said these things on different occasions. Matthew 13, this is how it will end at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 22, then the king told the attendants, tie, his, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You cannot have the Jesus of scriptures without the doctrine of judgment. I love how Spurgeon said it. Think lightly of hell and you will think lightly of the cross. Our writer then goes on to the terror then of the judgment that happens. Verse 30, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine and I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In order to drive home this, this terror, the author quotes loosely from the song of Moses in, in Deuteronomy 32. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Romans 12, 19 also. The phrase appears to be like a proverb. And it was undoubtedly understood by everyone in the church. Yeah, we say that all the time. Judgment is inevitable and it's impartial. And it will be equal. And then the ultimate terror statement. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It is a dreadful judgment. 
it'll be dreadful for those who have rejected him because divine judgment is perfect, perfectly equitable. <laughs> you get what you deserve. And that is not going to be a good thing. What do you deserve? What do you deserve if you reject God? Well, what do you deserve if you reject anyone? Separation, right? I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about here. The dread involves separation from God. C.S. Lewis, union with God's nature is bliss, but separation from him is horror. You know why it's dreadful? It's because it's eternal. If you could travel light speed from, for 100 years in one direction and try to escape this galaxy and then travel at light speed, oh, that wasn't far enough, 3,000 more years in the other direction. And if you repeated the process 100,000 million times until you tried to reach every galaxy, eternity had just begun. It blows your mind how long eternity is. And think about separation for that whole time. It is an awful doctrine. Falling into the hands of the living God as an unbeliever is awful. But we know there's wonderful salvation. We know that we have fallen into the arms of who? Christ. Which he extends to us. And these arms are stretched wide on the cross. He was not only our atoning sacrifice, but he takes care of the sin issues completely and he turns aside the wrath of God. And Jesus still has those same arms out for us today. And all we have to do is fall into the arms of Jesus. Verse 32, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Our writer is telling them very clearly that you you who are listening to this, you're not those people. You aren't the ones that are running the other direction. And he gives them evidence that they were true Christians. Think, think about this. When I read those verses, wasn't there a little part of you, for those of you who are believers and know what's going on in this world and in our country today, isn't part of you going, oh, man, that could have been written like yesterday by some blogger. Let me reread that. But remember the former days when being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through the reproaches and tribulations. Well, that's not happening at all today, right, to Christians? You kidding? 
That's exactly what's happening. And partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. You're guilty by association. You showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property. I am firmly convinced that it is only a matter of time, if things don't change, that our government here in the United States will start taking away churches, will take, take them down, will close them, because we have hate speech, because I preach on judgment. Or I preach that there's only one way back to God. Or that I say this or that. And some of you may go, "Uh, you're just blowing smoke. It isn't going to happen. We have a constitution. Last time I checked, constitutions can be disregarded and changed and blown up. What happens in Canada will happen here potentially. What happens in other parts of the world will happen here. And what we need to do is stand. But I'm not standing for the U.S. Constitution. I'm not standing for any of that. I'm standing to tell people about Jesus. Because I care about them. I don't want them to have this happen. You get it? And these people got that and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession, a lasting one. So don't throw away your confidence. Don't throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You see this word destruction in there in verse 39. It means different words in the New Testament. Perish, die, waste. It can mean eternal. It doesn't mean eternal destruction in every instance. A believer who, for example, does not walk by faith and goes back to their old life and wastes a lot of their life, that doesn't mean that they're not saved anymore. Right? I mean, that's not what this is talking about. If that person is a believer and eventually turns around and they got this big old gap of yuck in their life, Christ still pays for that. Right? He pays for all our sins. You know, what it comes down to is this. We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. I've I've been a pastor now for, I'm itching towards 30 years. It's kind of scary. And I have met plenty of people who have turned their backs on God. And have spent years wandering in the wilderness. But I've also met some other people. People who have wandered in the wilderness and have come back. Because all of us start in the wilderness. And it's us responding to the call of Christ and accepting him and believing him and living in him and obeying his word in that we can be confident. And as we walk by faith, the beauty of this whole thing is that our great high priest guides us. If there is ever a time in the history of our nation right now, as Christians, I am so thankful that Jesus is guiding and not anyone else. Because it's crazy out there, as I said at the beginning. It's crazy. But Jesus is my high priest. Jesus is my guide. Jesus 
perfects me. Jesus perfects you. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. May we all have faith to the preserving of the soul. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this incredibly powerful section 